Today's episode of The History Guy brought to you by Magellan TV. It is all too easy when discussing grand historical events to forget that history is at its core human. That's particularly true of the most dramatic of human endeavors, war. When talking about generals and campaigns and battles, we tend to forget that wars are fought by people, soldiers and sailors and airmen who often fight over tiny forgotten pieces of ground that for a few hours or days witness the height of human drama, of tragedy, of heroism, of human conflict, and then are forgotten. On April 24th, 1943, an important event happened in the Second World War. Troops of the British First Army captured a nearly intact Tiger tank, the first to be captured by the British. The tank, Tiger 131, allowed the Allies to study the fearsome Panzer Mark VI. That tank has been preserved today. It's the only running Tiger One in the world, and Tiger 131 is arguably the most famous single piece of armor still remembered from the Second World War, and yet the details of its capture are shrouded in mystery. A testimony to one of those forgotten pieces of ground on the human side of history. The fight to take and hold the hill at a little place in Tunisia called Guriat el Atak deserves to be remembered. But before we traipse off to Tunisia, I want to talk to you about the sponsor of today's episode, Magellan TV. If you watch The History Guy, you know that we're fans of Magellan TV, and I know many of you are already subscribers. And whether you're a new subscriber or a long-term subscriber, you'll want to check out a newly posted documentary called Titans of War. If you're a fan of armored combat, then you really want to watch this documentary, which shows you films and diagrams of tanks from the beginning of tank warfare all the way up to the modern era. It interviews experts on tank warfare. It shows you inside places like the Tank Museum in Dorset and France's Museum de Blinde. And uh, it will remind you, if you're like me, of why you signed up for Magellan in the first place. For those who haven't signed up, Magellan TV is a streaming service for great premium in-depth documentaries with over 2,000 documentaries on nature, science, culture, and of course, history. The documentaries are carefully curated so you can find the ones you want. They're all high quality, including 4K resolution made by documentary filmmakers. They put on new content all the time, and with the streaming service, there's no ads or interruptions. You can watch Magellan using mobile apps for your devices. You can use it on Fire TV, Apple TV, and Roku, so you can watch pretty much everywhere. Magellan brings the means to be informed about the world and his past in a way that is accessible, affordable, and in today's world, essential. If you haven't already signed up for Magellan TV, you really should. And if you sign up using the link in the description, you'll get the first month free. In March 1943, the Allies were closing in on the Tunisian port city of Tunis, intent on eliminating Army Group Africa and setting the stage for an invasion of Italy, what Winston Churchill called the soft underbelly of Hitler's fortress Europe. The previous November, the Allies of the British First Army had taken French North Africa and made a run for Tunis, an attempt to get to the port of Tunis to block supplies to German forces in North Africa and prevent the Germans from building forces for a defense of Tunisia. The Allies came close, but had come up short against the 5th Panzer Army at a series of heights called Jebel el Amr. The Coldstream Guards briefly held the heights, but were forced back on December 25th. Both sides were exhausted and paused to regroup. The Allies named the heights Long Stop Hill, the Germans, referring to the date they had retaken the heights, called the formation Christmas Mountain. In the spring, the British 8th Army won significant victories against the German-Italian Panzer Army in Libya. The Germans had fallen back on Tunisia and joined with the 5th Army to create Army Group Africa. Some 350,000 German and Italian troops were now defending Tunisia from nearly a half million Allied troops of the 1st and 8th Armies from Britain, America, France, Poland, Greece, and the Commonwealth. Despite the setback in Libya, the Axis was in a strong position in Tunisia. Tunisia had two deep water ports, only a few hundred miles from Italian bases in Sicily to provide supply. And the western border with Algeria was protected by the Atlas Mountains, offering favorable terrain for defense, including Longstop Hill. The Allies were facing a difficult battle and difficult weather over difficult terrain as the Germans doggedly defended heights in North Africa. A hill was called a Jebel that stood between the British First Army under the command of General Sir Kenneth Anderson and Tunis. The battles were fought hill by hill, ridge by ridge, in places with names like Jebel Jaffa and Banana Hill and a terrifying place called the Basin. And among these many battles of the last phase of the campaign in North Africa was a fight for a nearly forgotten hill called Guriat el Atak. 
In April 1943, Army Group Africa was under the command of General Hans Jurgen von Armen, a veteran of Operation Barbarossa in Russia. Von Armen knew the situation his army faced. He said of the defense, The enemy is in the front. The sea is behind. There must be no more retreat. Longstop Hill was captured by the Allies April 22nd and 23rd. Infantry from the British 78th Battle Axe Division took the hill, but did so with heavy losses. The victory was largely facilitated by the exceptional hill climbing ability of the British Churchill tanks of the North Irish Horse, which arrived in a location unexpected by the German defenders at a crucial point. On April 23rd, the task of taking the hill called Guriat El Attack was assigned to the 1st Battalion of the Loyal North Lancashire Regiment and the 2nd Battalion of the North Staffordshire Regiment, supported by Churchill tanks of the 142nd Suffolk Regiment of the Royal Armoured Corps. The attack was part of a broader attack of the British 1st Infantry Division. Three German battalions defended the ridge, with a fourth supported by armor in reserve in case a counterattack was necessary. Defenders reportedly included elite units of the 1st Paratroop Panzer Division, the famed Hermann Goering Division. The attack moved forward under an artillery barrage that included smoke to protect the attacking troops, but also which obscured their own direction. The hill was protected by prepared positions, machine gun nests, and covered by artillery and mortars. In the advance, the Loyal's Battalion Headquarters Company walked into a minefield, mortally wounded the battalion commander and killing or wounded much of the command staff. When part of the battalion finally fought their way to the top of the ridge, they'd nearly run out of ammunition. Resupply had to be brought up under fire in lightly armored, open-topped Bren carriers. The Loyals were under continuous fire from mortars, machine guns, and snipers. The North Staffords were driven back by a German counterattack, taking casualties so extreme that their four rifle platoons had to be reorganized into two. That left the flank of the Loyals unprotected. Taking advantage of the gap, another German counterattack hit B Company, which was pushed back off the ridge and nearly wiped out, its company commander and all but one officer killed. The remaining officer, despite being wounded in the head, gathered the remaining men, hardly more than a platoon, and went to retake the lost ground. When confronted by a German machine gun position, the young lieutenant deployed his men to give him covering fire and tackled the machine gun post single-handed with his revolver, killing or capturing the crew and knocking out the gun. He did the same with two more machine gun positions. As the tiny group tried to consolidate their position, they came under sniper fire, and the brave lieutenant went to deal with the sniper's nest by himself. He was killed a few feet from his target. The 23-year-old lieutenant, Wilward Alexander Sandys Clark, was posthumously awarded the Victoria Cross. Apparently, bravery ran in his family. Through his mother's side, he was related to four other officers who had been awarded Britain's highest award for gallantry in the face of the enemy. C Company was in just as desperate a shape. The company commander had taken command of the battalion, and the company had been reduced to one officer. Lieutenant Douglas Wilford Pastor led his men in a counterattack to retake a position. After better fighting, only 20 men remained to hold that position. Though wounded, the lieutenant stayed with his men. He was awarded the Military Cross for this action. But in the end, the men of the Loyals and the North Staffords were unable to hold the ground that they had fought so hard to take. Pushed back, the brigade took more than 500 casualties that day. The 142nd Royal Armored Corps lost 29 of its 52 Churchill tanks. The following day, April 24th, the task of retaking the hill was given to men of the 3rd Infantry Division, the 2nd Battalion of the Sherwood Foresters, and the 1st Battalion of the King's Shropshire Light Infantry. The attack was supposed to be supported by Churchill tanks of the 142nd RAC and the 48th Royal Tank Regiment, although the armor was delayed by heavy fire and the infantry moved on without them. The foresters managed to retake the hill in hard fighting, calling on division artillery to help silence the mortar attacks. The war diary of the 2nd Battalion of the Sherwood Foresters is surprisingly scant on the battle. That war diary was actually completed months later, and in the hard fighting of the Tunisian campaign, the invasion of Sicily, and the Italian campaign, the 2nd Battalion of the Sherwood Foresters had taken 200% casualties. By the time the war diary was written, there was hardly anyone left who remembered Guriat El Atak. But the fighting must have been fierce. Members of the Foresters received 10 battle awards that day, including the battalion commander, Lieutenant Colonel R.T.K. Pye, nicknamed Puddin Pie, who was awarded the Distinguished Service Order for leading his troops that day. Reminiscent of the heroics of the officers of the Loyals the previous day, a lieutenant from the Forester's D Company was killed while single-handedly engaging a machine gun nest. While the battle for the heights at Guriatel attack is recorded in several battle reports, oddly perhaps the most notable event of the day was not clearly recorded. After taking the hill, the Foresters and the KSLI faced constant shelling and determined counterattacks. 
Among them were attacks by German Panzer VI tanks, uh, the dreaded Tiger tanks that had only come into action the previous December, and only recently in North Africa. The tanks attacking the ridge that day were from the 504th Heavy Tank Battalion had only arrived in Tunisia in March. The Panzer Mark VI was feared by the Allies because of its thick armor and powerful gun, although not well liked by its German crews, who felt it bogged down too easily in the mud of North Africa due to its weight. The Churchills engaged the Panzers and took several losses to the 8.8 centimeter guns of the Tigers. There is a report from the commander of B Squadron of the 48th Royal Tank Regiment saying that a Panzer VI had been hit by a Churchill and the crew had bailed out, and a later record of another Churchill firing at what appeared to be an abandoned Mark VI that they thought was being used as cover for a sniper. But it's not clear whether these were the same Mark VI, nor exactly how it was disabled. As the Foresters and the King's Shropshire Light Infantry defended the ridge from repeated counterattack under constant shelling, among them sat an extraordinary prize, a virtually intact Panzer Mark VI, the first to be captured by the British. Technical crews crawled all over it, trying to learn its secrets, even as shellfire was still striking the hill. The Tiger Tank, the first tank of the 3rd Platoon of the 1st Company of the 504th Heavy Tank Battalion, turret number 131, was eventually returned to England, where its testing provided valuable information to the Allies regarding one of Germany's most fearsome weapons. And yet it is unclear exactly how it was captured. The war diary of the 2nd Battalion of the Foresters doesn't mention the tank being disabled, merely saying, At nightfall, however, the enemy tank withdrew from positions which would have been dangerous to them by night, and the German artillery took over the job of making the Foresters uncomfortable. The heights fell. The German and Italian armies in North Africa were finally defeated in May, with some 300,000 Axis troops surrendering to the Allied forces. The armies in the war moved on. The story of how Tiger 131 was captured was lost in the shuffle. The story of the capture of Tiger 131 is shrouded in mystery. The project to go and capture and return an intact Tiger tank was, well, a closely guarded secret. Soldiers fighting that day didn't seem to realize the specific importance of just one more event and just one more battle of a long war. For many years it was thought that Tiger 131 was actually captured two days earlier and ten miles away at a hill called Jebel Jaffa, a mistake that, because of an officer whose name was Peter Gudgeon who happened to be both Jebel Jaffa and Murad al Attaq, and then was one of the officers who later tested Tiger 131 when it was returned to England, apparently simply conflated these two battles that were so close together. The true story didn't come out until a visitor to the Tank Museum in Dorset heard the story of 131 and it reminded him of a story that had been told to him by his father, who was part of the Second Foresters. And then the Tank Museum researchers found out that the tank was not captured at Jebel Jaffa, but at Murat al Attack, using both the story from the visitor's father and a newly discovered newspaper article from the time. The story at that time was that the Sherwood Foresters, being attacked by Tiger tanks, had desperately turned around an anti-tank gun that had been abandoned by the retreating Germans and used that to disable the tank. And that is an exciting story, except that research on the damage to the Tiger tank, which is still visible today, suggests that it was actually disabled by a six-pounder from one of the many Churchill tanks in the area. The shot luckily striking off the tank's barrel and lodging itself in the tank's turret ring, causing the turret to be stuck and forcing the crew to abandon the tank. But it's not sure which of the many Churchills there might have fired that fatal round. The damage to Tiger 131 was repaired using parts from other destroyed Tigers. It was displayed after the capture of Tunis, inspected by King George VI, and returned to England for testing. It was transferred to the Tank Museum in 1951. In 2003, after 13 years of restoration work that included replacing the tank's engine, as the original had been cut into cross sections for display at the museum, Tiger 131 was returned to the Tank Museum fully operational. The only running Tiger 1 tank in the world. You can go see Tiger 131 today. The damage from the tank round that disabled it is still visible. I highly recommend a visit. But despite the fame of Tiger 131, the most surprising part is how much is still unknown, still being pieced together decades later. If it were for Tiger 131, the entire attack at Gurat Al Attack might be forgotten. Uh, a place so obscure that it's hard to find on a map. A battle so tiny in the scheme of the war that it doesn't even merit its own entry on Wikipedia. A tiny plot of ground where men fought and died in the course of all too human history.
I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy, short snippets of forgotten history between 10 and 15 minutes long. And if you did enjoy, please go ahead and click that thumbs up button. If you have any questions or comments or suggestions for future episodes, please write those in the comment section. I will be happy to personally respond. Be sure to follow The History Guy on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and check out our merchandise on teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes on forgotten history, all you need to do is subscribe.